Hello everyone, welcome to Think Kingdom Online. Uh, we're so happy that you're with us here today. Be sure to let us know if this is your first time by leaving a comment down below. And uh, we just wanna welcome you and greet you. And we're so happy that you're watching with us. Thank you. Good morning. Here at Think Kingdom, we encourage you guys to stay connected. One way to do that is to text the word CONNECT to the number down below. Another way to stay connected is to fill out our Connect card. If you're watching this on your computer, you can take your phone out and point it at the screen and follow the link to our online Connect card. Or, if you're watching on your phone, there is a link in the caption. Hey, this is Nate. I'm one of the elders at Think Kingdom, and I also do FAQ. That's Frequently Asked Questions. It goes live on Think Kingdom's Facebook page Wednesdays at 12.33. And uh, we just answer questions that you have, things uh, ranging from should we read the Old Testament, when was Jesus born, uh, really anything that you're interested in knowing. So if you have questions, send them our way. Hey guys, I am Tiffany and I want to invite you to the Zoom After Party Sermon Recap. What is it? It's an opportunity for shortly after the service, joining other believers to discuss what was laid on their heart as they listen intently to the message to the Word of God. The question is, how can you join? Good question. If you look in the comments section, we will provide a link. As simple as that. Click on that link and you'll be invited to join in from people from all walks of life as we are growing together because that is what community is all about. Let's chat about how God spoke to us during the message. Thanks. As you know, we're all about staying connected from our connect cards to our small groups. If you'd like to know more information about our groups, go to the website provided here and click on the connect tab. There you'll find more information about our small groups and be able to join one. We look forward to connecting with you. Good morning, and welcome to Think Kingdom Online. We want to take this time to remind you of the importance of staying engaged. And, and there's several ways of doing that. One way is, as you're listening to the service, and there's, if there's something that stands out to you and just grabs your attention, comment below and share it with others around you. Another way is by sharing the service mm -hmm. um, so that we can invite others to church. So, my sister and I, we welcome you to Think Kingdom Church. And we hope you enjoy the service. Oh, he is. 
This is Pastor Antoine. I want to thank you for watching. We have been in the series uh, Filter Seeing Through a Kingdom Lens for several weeks now, and this will be the final uh, message in this series. So I'm going to take the time, if you don't mind, um, to read uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 16. I want to read the entire uh, Beatitudes because I think it will... Um, help me summarize and, and, and also give us a uh, clear picture of what Jesus, remember this is a small part of, a, um, of the Sermon on the Mount, um, but I think a bit of, it, it will give us a clearer picture um, of what Jesus is, is actually referring to. Um, and so let's just read. Uh, 
Matthew chapter five, verse one, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure make peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you uh, because of me. Uh, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven and for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? Is it no longer good? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled upon people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Now, Jesus um, is is unpacking to us. You've heard me say this throughout this series, the uh, what it means to live in the kingdom that Jesus birth ushers us into the kingdom. And the character of a Christ follower, those who follow Christ, is actually unpacked in the Beatitudes. It's not unpacked in church membership, nor uh, not an organization or denominational ties. Jesus actually unpacks for us what it means to be a Christ follower. And as Christians, he also unpacks our influence that we can have in a dark and broken world. And so he um, he talks about two distinct ingredients of a Christ follower, salt and light. Now, salt preserves what has a tendency to spoil and light helps us to see in the dark. But isn't it sort of strange and bizarre that the poor and the poor and meek, the mourner and the merciful, the peacemaker can influence the world that's overwhelmed by evil, that these character traits, if you will, um, can literally influence the world. And and then when you talk about what happens when our appetite for righteousness is the driving force behind what we do, that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, his righteousness. And the only weapons that we have are the weapons of a pure heart. And Jesus knew that if the world perceived us as meek, if the world saw us as mourners or peacemakers, that potentially will make us easy targets. And persecution will be the result um, of that, uh, I guess, that trait. It's the survival of the fittest that the world sometimes employs. Uh, so, but despite the, the threat of persecution, Jesus says, as the, you know, as the poor in spirit, as the eight aforementioned traits, that these guys, this, these, these lowly men um, in the eyes of the first century world uh, and those followers, both men and women, those followers of Christ will be the salt of the earth in the light of the world. And so to the handful that's, that's following Jesus, this minority, he moves them beyond themselves. He moves them beyond their race, beyond their family origin, beyond even their natural abilities, that they would be salt and light to the world. And Jesus uses these common elements to describe their extraordinary and supernatural abilities in the hand of someone who's following Christ. And so in verse number 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled upon people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city situated 
on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. But here's what I want you to understand. I want you to get that the world and the church, God's people, are two different spheres. We are not the same or at least we shouldn't be. Two different communities, two different trains of thoughts, two different cultures. As Christ followers, we should act and behave different. The world recognizes hypocrites and oftentimes they bear witness to that contradiction that's unfortunately found in the church. And the world has a front row seat to our hypocrisy and they're very quick to point it out. But it's not that we are perfect, but until the church addresses its own, we will make a mockery of the ways of Jesus. And so the world awaits for the stumble of the church leader or the Christian leader or you. That sometimes as Christ followers, they see us as hypocrites or living contrary um, to the ways of Jesus. But as the church continues to advance the kingdom, we should not excuse our wrongdoing. Uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse three. It says, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. There are things that should not be named among God's people. We as Christ followers carry no flags. We don't have a country of origin. And, and, it's, and our identity isn't rooted in man-made structures. The need for salt and light shows the contrast between the followers of Christ and the world. But it's not arrogance of faith, but it's the humility of faith. Blessed are the meek, remember, um, who recognize their sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit, recognizing my sin. And it humbles us. It makes us realize that there is a need we have for God and that need that we have for God should also compel us to want others to experience what we have experienced. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled upon people's feet. Salt is a preservative like. Before refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food, especially meat. And so as as meat lives in its own element, it begins to, to uh, deteriorate and the world is deteriorating around us. And the reality, marriages, government, school systems, homes are deteriorating. So Jesus is literally saying you are the salt of the earth. Remember who he is addressing. He is not talking to everyone. He is talking to those who believe in him. He is talking to the redeemed, the regenerate and the, the regenerate and the and righteous people. Um, and he's and these uh, redeemed, regenerate and righteous people are made that way through faith in Jesus Christ and the surrendering of their will, our will to his. So God, he's referring to how God saved us by his grace when we believed in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And that makes us redeemed. That makes us born again, new creations and righteous. It makes us righteous because of him. And we can't take credit for it. This is a gift from God. So I want you to see how we become the salt of the earth, not because of what we do, not because of the accomplishments, bloodlines, heritage, uh, our um, connection to other. No, we become redeemed, born again, new creations and righteous because of him, Jesus, our faith in him. And remember, it's a gift. And so there are institutions and governments in which can frame laws uh, to influence the culture. 
But when the government fails or falls, God has always, in spite of governments, God has always intended that his people, Christ's followers, the people of God, will be the chief influence for the culture. If we are Christ followers, we become agents of active liberation. So God hears the cries of the oppressed. He takes notice and he sends his people. He sends the flaw, the weak, those who are full of excuses and fearful, and he empowers us through his spirit to respond. He empowers. So when he says that you are the salt of the earth, when he says you are the light of the word he, of the world, he is empowering us through his spirit. By faith in Jesus Christ. So God has always intended to use you. To advance his kingdom. But how do we get to become salt? How do we get to become light? It goes back to the, the origin of the whole Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the mourners who mourn over their sin, who have humility and hunger and thirst for righteousness. Mercy comes to us and flows from us. The pure in heart, seeing Jesus for who he is, our Savior, also our Lord, and understanding who we are. It, it makes us peacemakers, seeking reconciliation of others to God. And despite our best efforts to be peacemakers, he warns us that persecution comes. But in spite of it, we are the salt. But he also sends us a warning that if the salt should lose its taste, then how can it be being salty again? When salt loses its flavor, it loses its flavor when it's diluted when it's contaminated. We get to this point in Jesus' message after traveling through the Beatitudes, and as a result, you and I should become salty. Our saltiness remains when we stay at the feet of Jesus, when we learn from Jesus, when we live for Jesus, when we love like Jesus, it should cause us to lead people to Jesus, but we cannot lead anyone to a place that we've never been. And so he's inviting us in and we remain salty and we have to be careful that that we don't become as he has warned in verse number 14, that we lose our saltiness by being contaminated with the impurities of the world, that Christians, Christ followers can also lose their influence, not due to persecution, but to conformity. So Jesus is causing is calling us to be distinct apart from not identical, a part of the world. In other words, we are of the world, but not from the world. If you can't tell a Christ follower from a non Christ follower, He's saying in verse number 14, I'm sorry, 13, we are useless. But again, this is a kingdom perspective to be it's the be attitudes, not our old nature attitudes. So we don't beat people into the kingdom where God, God's influence governs our behavior, words or lives. But we love them into the kingdom like Jesus loved us into it. He is calling us to be salt, not cyanide. He's calling us to be the salt of the earth. Verse number 14. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Remember the contrast. The world is dark and empty. It's an abandoned house that's falling apart. Uh, but at its core, no matter how we dress it up, the world, it's falling apart. 
and the world continues to talk about its own enlightenment, but it's really just defining how dark it is. The utopia uh, it seeks will forever be beyond its grasp because it recognizes what's wrong, but can't get it right. So Jesus makes a bold statement here. Jesus is moving away from inward only now to outward. People should be able to see something in you. That distinctiveness have, has now become visible. But this is nothing new. Well, if you take a gander at the uh, Ten Commandments, you'll see that the first set deals with our relationship with God. He says, does he says, do not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. And so oftentimes we equate that to uh, making sure we don't take the Lord's name uh, in language in vain. But we also misuse God's name when we confess we know him, but act like we don't. So claiming authorization when we don't have it is taking God's name in vain. Prophesying things he never said is also misusing his name. And so the, the other set of Ten Commandments, it deals with our relationship with each other. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, so forth and so, so forth, right? But all of what is happening on the inside of us can be seen on the inside. We don't, there is a duty we have to God and there's an obligation to our neighbors. So it's not merely expressing our faith in God, his love for us as experienced through Christ Jesus, but also good deeds. Verse number 14, you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand and it gives light for all who are in the house in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Good works are practical, visible deeds of compassion. The light in us, which is Jesus, should be seen outside of us as Christ followers. We do not conceal the truth. We don't compromise. We do not pretend to be anything else but who we are in Christ Jesus. Our faith must be seen in words and deeds. Yes, not just confession of our faith, but the demonstration of our faith. Any church or person or community who claims Jesus that seek to hide has stopped following Jesus. We are called, remember, we are called to be ourselves in Christ. Uh, Christ followers are called to live openly as described by Jesus in the Beatitudes and be not ashamed of Christ. Um, it's not uh, the Facebook post that says, what is it? Uh, if you're, if uh, please share this, if you don't share this, um, you're ashamed of me. And if you're ashamed of uh, it's, it's, it's reference to Jesus. And if you're ashamed of Jesus publicly, then he will be ashamed of you. Um, that's not what that is. It's living my life as a Christ follower in the context of what I live, where I work and where I play. So they praise. They see us. The beauty is that they see the people around us. They see the works that are on display. And while seeing us, they glorify God. The beauty is that they see the grace of God and understand that is how we became who we are. You know, your friends that see, have watched your transformation, they should marvel because they know how you are or how you were. So our light is his light. And what we do is because of what he is doing in us. So they don't praise the lamp stand. They praise the source. They praise the light. And that's why you have value. It's not because of your own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ working in you. 
That is what makes us valuable. We are valuable not because of anything that we've done, but it's because he has declared that his works that's working in us is, is valuable, it's good. So let me wrap this up. First thing that I, I want us to take away from uh, the last several weeks is number one, Christ followers are different. I, like, I don't know what to say after that. Christ followers are different. Followers of Jesus are different. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by how? By the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. If we are not transformed by the renewing of our mind, we cannot discern what is good. We cannot discern what is pleasing. We cannot discern the perfect will of God. So Christ followers are different. Ephesians 4 and 17. So I tell you this and insist on on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles or the world as the world does in the futility of their thinking. And, and so what, what Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus is, listen, um, I, I, I beg you, I'm commanding you, you should no longer live like the world lives. First Peter 43, uh, 43, first Peter chapter four, verse three through four, you have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy their immorality and lust their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their worship of idols of course your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do so they talk about you so you've had we should have as christ followers we had enough living that way and the greatest tragedy tragedy of the church is when you cannot tell the difference between the church and the culture. Christ followers are different. The church in, 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 in let, the church within itself, um, as, as is commonly used um, as, as four walls, it's beyond that. It's it's. It's not this faceless institution with cold walls, but the church are people. And so if we cannot tell the difference between Christ followers and the culture. We have failed and the church cannot be a substitute for your relationship with God. The church can cultivate the, the gathering can cultivate your relationship with God. That's why in Hebrews, um, the writer says, forsake not of your assemblies of yourselves together. Don't do not not gather. And, and, and this pandemic and, and all the things, thank God for the pro progress that we're making. Uh, but some of us have chosen not to gather. I'm not just talking about being in person or uh, being online and the difference. But some of us have fallen away and we have chosen not to gather at all. That is not healthy as a Christ follower. And so conforming, it should never be in our vocabulary. Christ followers are different. The assumption that Jesus is making, the assumption of our entire faith should make, should the, the assumption of the world, the, the picture that the world should get from our faith is that we are different. We don't serve God, ourselves, or the world when we minimize the difference between Christ followers and the world we are different please write that down we are different the second thing in terms of this wrap-up you must be who and what you are in Christ second Corinthians 5 and 17 this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. A new life has begun. No, you're not perfect. You are being sanctified. You are being cleansed daily into the, in, into the image of Jesus Christ. But there is a new conviction that you have. There is a new way to see now. It's happening in you. And although it may be beyond your grasp, 
and you you have not experienced complete wholeness or complete healing. The mere fact that you desire it, the mere fact that you are aware of it is the recognition that the new work has begun in you. You are the salt. He's not talking to the person beside you. He's not. Ta he's talking to you. You are the salt. Remain salty. You are the light of the world. You must shine and not conceal the truth. Sin, fear, laziness, compromise must be rejected in your life. Why? Because the world needs you. When you are not taking your faith to the place where you live, when you're not taking your faith to the place you work, when you're not taking to your faith to the place uh, you play, that void that you were meant to feel will be fertilized with the frustrations of this present world. The people in those places need to see and experience the radical Jesus who brings love, joy and peace. But they will not see Jesus if you don't show up. You must be what you are and who you are in Christ. And no one can can replace you. Here's the reality. They can place your job. They can replace your position. They can replace those things. But you are valuable and you're so valuable that Jesus Christ himself died for you. We can make it private, but we experience the love of God publicly. You, you, you. We should never be surprised by people sinning, even when they're Christian leaders. If when they fall, it causes you to stumble. It may be that you have more faith in them than you had in Jesus. And so our jobs, uh, if you will, is to point us, point the world back to Jesus. So the first thing is Christ followers are different. The second thing is you must be who and what you are in Christ. And the final thing is salt and light, two sides of the same coin. Let me explain. I mentioned before that salt preserves, it prevents decay and it slows down what is rotten. So salt preserves and it slows down what is rotten rotten salt you are salt so the followers of jesus are sent into this world to slow down the decay of it we are to be engaged remember meat goes bad but salt slows it down um, so salt pervert um, preserves prevents decay and slows down what is rotten so salt in this reference is to stop the spread of evil or the consequences of evil. That's why Christians are engaged in human sex, human sex trafficking, racism, the eradication of hunger, homelessness, sexism, misogyny. We are involved in those things because we are to stop the spread of evil and to preserve. So idolatry, self-centeredness will always lead to total depravity. Romans chapter one, verse 28. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do not um, so they do not what is not right. So they don't do what is right. So when people reject what they know of God, God gives them up to their own distorted notions and perverted passions. And so as Christ followers, we speak out against evil in all forms. We are not meant to remain quiet in our safe places and spaces of worship, buying all the sur sur survival supplies, burying ourselves in the bunker, becoming preppers, declaring that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. We are to be salt. We are to um, stop the spread of evil. And this is not just an effort to help the casualties of a sick world, but to change the structures that cause the casualties. Salt and light. But remember, I said it's the it's these two sides of the same coin. 
he also says light and light exposes darkness. And so we are to spread the truth, whereas salt may be seen as walls uh, of restraint. So we build walls of restraint. We must offer the beauty of being born again. This is the marriage between evangelism, good news and social justice activism. Now, I already know that the words, those two words, social justice, especially in some evangelical spaces, is a hard word and people are so upset with it. I get it. But the reality of it is to improve the human condition isn't unbiblical. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. We must not pit salt and light against each other. The gospel is the answer, but action is still needed. This is speaking out against abortion, champion abortion laws, while at the same time sharing the love, the loving good news of Jesus Christ. It's two sides of the same coin. It's being heavenly some of us are so heavenly with no feet in the earth and that is to be in denial the world needs both the world needs salt and light it's decaying and it needs salt it's dark and it needs light we cannot separate jesus from his mission to seek and save those who are lost god in the flesh becomes for us what we cannot become for ourselves. So in turn, we become for others the salt and light they need. So the world claims being woke, but it's really asleep. Recognizing that there is good and evil in the world, it's like hearing a rattle coming from your engine. You know something is wrong, but you don't know how to fix it. Awareness isn't a diagnosis. The noise coming from that engine, the check engine light, is sending you signals that something is wrong. But ignoring it doesn't make the problem go away. No matter how loud you turn up the radio, the noise is still there, whether you can hear it or not. A proper diagnosis can lead to proper treatment. But sometimes, well, in this case, the fixing is beyond our own ability. And for some of us, we have ignored the problem for far too long. And so I end filter seeing through a kingdom lens how I started. Matthew chapter five, verse one. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them. If you want to see through a kingdom lens, we must go back to Jesus being our teacher. That's the only way. Learning from Jesus. Living for him. Loving like him. It's the only way to lead people to him. And the kingdom perspective is that he has caused us to be salt and light in the earth, to stop the spirit of evil and to share the good news. And we need him to teach us daily how to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your righteousness that you've given us through our faith in you. I pray uh, for the hearers of this message. I pray that as we continue to serve you, we learn to serve each other well. We serve not just each other, but our friends, family, and our enemies. Father, I pray that you um, show us our importance as we are part of your plan to be the salt and light of the earth and the world. But Father, we can do nothing without you. So God, help us to be all that you've called us to be. These are your servants' prayers, your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey, thank you for watching. This is Pastor Antoine. I really just want to take a moment to thank you for your offering. Thank you for your gifts and to just encourage you. We give primarily for three reasons, to honor God um, as a source of all our provision. God uses us to be his hands and feet. And so we give of our treasure and our treasures. And also we give um, our talent and skills. We have people working behind the camera. And so they are skilled at doing that. And then there's, there's a camera itself that allows us to broadcast and allow us to go into different marketplaces, such as YouTube and Facebook. So you're giving actually helps not only all of us to honor God, but also helps us to spread uh, the ministry. So another reason why we give is to support the work of the ministry. And so we have the greatest message that's ever been told. And so every time you give, you allow us to tell that message, to share that message of faith. And so whether we're meeting in person or whether we're meeting online, your gift allows us to do the work of ministry. So remember, it's not just your financial gift. We definitely appreciate that, but also your skills and your talents that allow us to do ministry. And so the third reason why we give is to support the household of faith. There are people that's in our church and also in the greater community that need support. And so we're trying to be not the source because Christ alone is the source. We're trying to be a resource that God uses in Kannapolis and the surrounding cities. So I want to thank you uh, for giving. And so you will see on the screen ways to give and i just want to thank you as the lead pastor of think kingdom church for every gift that you've sung